Entrevista. Hi. Okay. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be here and tell you a little bit about my recent work. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about tuning the standard model gauge group in F theory in a uh, particularly general way. And so uh, what I'm going to do in this talk is first start with an overview of what we need to know from F-theory and also 6D anomaly cancellation, because we're going to use that a lot as a tool. And then I'm going to introduce a definition of what I call generic matter, which will be useful as an organizational principle for the rest of the talk. And then I'm going to talk about a class of generic F-theory tunings of this gauge group, which is the standard model gauge group, in particular with the Z6 quotient. And then finally, I'm going to uh, construct a virus cross model that captures all of the models that I talked about. Okay, so let's start with the overview. <laughs> so first, uh, let's go through the basics of F-theory. So F-theory can be thought of as a non-perturbative formulation of type 2B compactifications that allow for general PQ subject rates. And an important feature of this is that it allows us to have access to a larger class of compactifications because the compactification space is not required to be collabial in order to preserve some supersymmetry. So in type 2B, there's an axial biloton field that contains the axion and the biloton. Uh, that is magnetically sourced by the presence of seven brains, which means that in a generic seven brain configuration, you will uh, generally have non trivial background fields, which is why we can't uh, go to the usual Calabi out compactification, and that's why we need some formulation of this type. And so the main insight that leads to F theory is that the axiodiloton transforms under SL2Z in the same way as the complex structure of the torus under modular transformations. And so we can identify tau, the axiodiloton, at each point of the compactification space B with the complex structure of a torus, which will lead to a genus 1 vibration. And in particular, we're going to require each torus to have a marked point. So we'll ultimately have an elliptic vibration, which we're using to encode the variation of the axiodiloton uh, over each point space time. So what does this look like? Here's a nice picture. We have here our compactification space, which is our compact base. Down here, the extended space that we are uh, our non-compact dimensions. And what we're doing is uh, putting an elliptic fiber over each point in the compact base, giving us an elliptically fibered claudial manifold. In this case, we need the claudial condition to preserve uh, supersymmetry, and it's important to note that this is this Claudio constraint is for the entire space, the total space of the vibration, not the compactification space. So we have a torus over each point in the base, which gives us this genus one vibration. And because each of these tori has a marked point, making it an elliptic fiber, these marked points together form a section of the vibration, which is why it is an elliptic vibration, not just a genus one. Okay, so this kind of structure has a uh, nice description in the form of the Weierstrass model. So for just a, a single elliptic curve, for example, you can describe any elliptic curve with a Weierstrass equation, where uh, x, y, and z are coordinates in an ambient projective space, and this equation cuts out a hypersurface that is the elliptic curve for fixed uh, f and g. Now, because we want an elliptic curve over every point in the base, we just promote f and g to be locally functions on the base. Um, more technically, they're actually sections of line bundles over the base. And so this, yes, go ahead. Um, so do you, require, uh, uh, do you require to have a section for the f-theory setup to be well defined? Or yeah, so, so we're going to require that there is a section. You can talk about um, genus 1 vibrations mm -hmm. that don't have a section, and then you go to what's called the Jacobian vibration, which gives you a section, and then you can do F-theory on that. Mm -hmm. um, for this talk, we're always going to assume that we have a section. Yeah. OK, so this is the reason, uh, because this is our nice mathematical formulation, this is why our goal for this talk is going to be to find the Weierstrass model that describes the uh, models that we're interested in. 
We're also going to be particularly interested in where the fiber degenerates over points in the base. So when we find uh, singularities in the fiber at co-dimension one, so for example, along this red curve here, uh, this tells us that there are seven brains wrapping that divisor, and that gives rise to a gauge group. And again, you can think of this always as just regular type 2b, so this is just the statement that stacks of seven brains give rise to gauge groups. And then at co-dimension two, where you could, for example, have two of these seven brain stacks intersecting one another, we get massless mapping. And you can talk about what happens at higher co-dimension singularities, but this is going to be what we're focusing on for today. Do you assume the singularity to be a compact submanifold, or can be a non-compact divisor? Uh, and in general, it could be a non-compact divisor. We're, we're only going to be considering yeah, compact calabias in this case, and compact uh, divisors for today. Yeah. It's compact calabia, it's compact divisor. Exactly. It's not exactly. But you can talk about non-compact calabias, and then you can talk about non-compact divisors. OK. So F theory is useful to us for a number of reasons. As I already said, it gives us access to a larger class of compactifications. It also very nicely gives us a global picture of the connected moduli space of 6D supergravity. So um, six-dimensional supergravity is a very nice playground for us to learn things, uh, both about supergravity theories and, and about F theory. Uh, it's the first uh, number of dimensions working your way down from 10, where you can have charged matter in representations other than the adjoint. And it has this nice connected moduli space. F theory allows us to make statements like the fact that uh, there are large branches of the moduli space where you have gauge groups that cannot be phased away. Um, so from the low energy point of view, from the supergravity point of view, this is the statement that these gauge groups will have matter content that is insufficient to satisfy the D-term constraints. So you cannot supersymmetrically phase away these gauge groups. And you get, uh, there are some typical factors that show up uh, of this kind. There are other gauge groups that cannot appear as non hexable factors, like SU5, so they always require tuning, and they are hexable. And further, there are some gauge groups that can't be realized at all, such as SU500. And we find that uh, most of the branches of the moduli space tend to have a large number of these non hexable gauge factors. And uh, if you additionally say tune an SU5 that you're interested in, then these, these factors, these extra gauge factors can be hidden sector dark matter, which is useful for modeling. Now we're also interested in four dimensions, of course, because that's the number of dimensions that we observe. Um, and the story is similar at a geometric level, but it's complicated by several factors. So first off, the moduli are generally lifted by a superpotential, which means we don't have this nice connected moduli space. And the fluxes and the superpotential can affect the non-hexable gauge factors. So we typically refer to them in the four-dimensional context as geometrically non-hexable, because it could be the case that the, uh, the fluxes might break the non-hexable gauge group, or there might be moduli stabilization that uh, puts you at some location that additionally has tuned gauge factors that maybe you didn't really want. Uh, an important thing to note for the model building purposes is that in four dimensions you can have SU3 times SU2 as a geometrically non hexable uh, uh, gauge product. So this is useful if you're interested in building the standard model, for example. So as I'm going to be trying to deduce. How about SU5? Uh, SU5 does not appear as a non hexable Again, for Again, yeah. So actually, it's the same list, but you also have SU2, SO7, and G2. That's all. Yeah. And up in 60, you can get products of uh, SU2 and G2, as you see right. here, but, but as single factors. Right. They don't appear there. Yeah. OK, so as I'm going to be talking about tuning the standard model in F theory, uh, it's worth talking about different approaches to finding the standard model in F theory. So there's really two binary choices you could make. You can try to uh, find the gut or directly find the standard model. And you can try to find it uh, in these non hexable gauge factors, or you can try to tune it. So sort of the first thing that people did, and the most extensively uh, researched approach to this, is to tune a gut like SU5. Um, this has been talked about extensively. You can also try to find a non hexable gut factor, like an E8 and then maybe break it by fluxes. 
and of course, it's difficult to figure out, uh, again, the story with fluxes and the super potential and where your modular stabilization happens, but you can talk about this. You can also try to look uh, at these non hexable SU3 times SU2 uh, gauge products, and that has been discussed as well. Or you could try to directly tune the standard model gauge group, and this is what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay, so before we go on to actually uh, talk about generic matter and these tunings, I just want to review a bit of 60 anomaly cancellation because it's going to come up a fair amount during the talk. So in six dimensions, the anomalies arise from uh, four, uh, four internal leg box diagrams. This is in 4D you have triangle diagrams. And the condition for uh, anomaly cancellation is that the eight-form anomaly polynomial factorizes in this form. And if it does, then you can add couplings of this form uh, to cancel the anomaly. So you have these, these tree diagrams that will cancel the anomalous contribution from the box diagrams. And an important thing to note is the presence of these A and B. These are just the coefficients of the green Schwartz terms that we're adding to the Lagrangian to cancel the anomaly. You can also think of them as the string charges of the gravitational engaged instantons. And requiring that the anomaly polynomial factorizes in this way yields the anomaly cancellation conditions. So now I'm just going to flash up the anomaly cancellation conditions real quick. They're pretty complicated, but I just want to bring your attention to a few points. So first we have uh, these H, V, and T are the numbers of hypermultiplets, vector multiplets, and tensor multiplets. And there's a gravitational anomaly cancellation condition that constrains uh, given a choice of gauge group, which will fix your V, and given a choice of the number of tensor multiplets, you now have a fixed count of the number of hypermultiplets, which the number of uncharged scalars uh, in the hypermultiplets are exactly our complex structure moduli from F theory. They give the dimension of the moduli space of the supergravity theory. So that's an important thing to note. Uh, the other thing to note is that these A's and B's, which I just said were the green Schwartz coefficients, they appear on the left-hand sides of all of these conditions. And so for a fixed choice of A's and B's, these right-hand sides are telling you the number of hypermultiplets charged under a given representation of the gauge group. And they involve these group theoretic factors uh, defined down here. So for a fixed choice of A's and B's, we're going to end up with some set of solutions to these equations that will give us the possible matter spectrum. OK. So now with uh, that out of the way, I'm going to move on to introducing this gen generic matter classification. So let's start in six-dimensional supergravity, where I can really concretely define what I mean by generic matter. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix a gauge group, and I'm going to fix a choice of anomaly coefficients uh, that are sufficiently small. And then with those choices, I'm going to define generic matter to be the matter that lives in the highest dimensional branch of the moduli space. And so this is a natural definition for what generic means in the same sense that if I take a dart and throw it at the blackboard, uh, then it's more generic to have um, landed somewhere off of a given curve that I chose ahead of time than it is to land on that curve. It's a higher dimensional space. It's also important that I fix the gauge group here because, as I said before, there are non fixable clusters and non fixable gauge groups that can arise, which the are. Generic ignoring potentials and all that, you mean? Or not in 60? Yeah, yeah, I'm sticking to 60 for right now. So you're not worrying about those questions. I'm not worrying about that yet. So that's why I'm starting in 60 supergravity so I can be really concrete about this. We have this big connected module case. Right. And I'm fixing the gauge group because there's a separate question of what is a more generic gauge group, and these non fixable clusters are exactly sort of the most generic gauge groups. And so this is a separate question of what matter is most generic once I fix the choice of gauge group. OK, so as an example, uh, if you have an SUN gauge factor, then the generic matter representations are the fundamental adjoint and anti-symmetric, two index anti-symmetric representations, uh, with some caveats for small n. And for a U1 gauge factor, the generic charges are charge 1 and 2. So these are also seemingly the uh, simplest representations we can think of, and that's generally a feature of, of this generic matter classification. 
Okay, so for a large class of gauge groups, it turns out that the number of generic matter representations that you will find exactly matches the multiplicity of non-trivial anomaly cancellation conditions. So for example, for U1, there are two non-trivial anomaly cancellation conditions that can string the multiplicities of charged matter. And as we saw, the generic charges were charge 1 and 2. And so in the general case, we have uh, a system of equations that has the same cardinality as the number of variables for the uh, hypermultiplicity charge under generic matter. And we can solve the anomaly cancellation conditions for generic matter representations. And this leads to what we call anomaly equivalences, which allow us to see, for example, that for U1, uh, if we take an anomaly consistent theory, um, then we can trade away six charge two multiplets and 10 charge zero multiplets for a single charge three multiplet and 15 charge one multiplets. So we can make this exchange in any anomaly consistent theory to arrive at another anomaly consistent theory. And this uh, exchange exactly shows us what we mean by generic matter, because recall that in the supergravity context, the moduli are the uncharged massive scalars. So the reason that uh, charge three is not a generic matter representation is because in order to move to a point in moduli space where we have an additional charge three multiplet, we had to consume 10 of our moduli. Okay. So now we want to connect this to F theory. So it turns out that the matter representations we find that are generic under this classification match exactly what come from the F theory constructions with the simplest singularity structure, which is very nice. So for example, for SUN, there are what are known as Tate models. So you can take this long Weierstrass <coughs> form. Uh, if you want to write this in the Weierstrass form we saw earlier, you can just complete the square on the left and complete the cube on the right. Um, and so there's this prescription for uh, tuning SUN in F theory where you take this form and then just tune each of the AI to vanish to a particular order in the locus sigma where you want to support your SUN gauge factor. And in all except for one recently discovered case, these get exactly generic matter for SUN. And if you go look at that, uh, that exceptional case, you will find that there actually is an additional tuning of moduli. So this is still consistent. You can count the moduli there and see that it's not really generic. For U1, there's what's known as the Morrison-Park model, which is shown here in the short Weierstrass form. And uh, this gives exactly charge 1 and charge 2 matter uh, for a single U1 gauge factor. So this is really nice. It means that F theory plays nicely with this uh, classification of generic matter. And in 60, at least, we could equivalently think of this as being defined from these simplest F theory constructions. And we're going to use that uh, in four dimensions when we're trying to define generic matter. So as Kumar pointed out, we no longer have this nice uh, supergravity definition in four dimensions because the superpotential spoils this for us. And we also can't uh, play the game of matching the multiplicity to the multiplicity of the anomaly cancellation conditions because anomaly cancellation is weaker in four dimensions. But from a geometric standpoint, the arguments about the underlying dimension uh, and construction complexity for the uh, Claudio 4 theory <coughs> still follows through. And so we actually expect from this matching to F theory in six dimensions that we find the exact same generic matter representations in four dimensions. And so this is going to be our definition of 4D generic matter. We're going to say in four dimensions, we have the exact same generic matter representations we saw in 60, motivated by this sort of generic F theory matter matching that we saw in six dimensions. Okay. But that may not be physically generic. Say again? That's not generic, but not physically, because physically are, there are other considerations, so therefore generic here is... Yeah, so, so might this... mislead us to this, uh, That's true. This is in the same sort of spirit as people talking about uh, geometrically non feasible for example, SU3 times SU2 factors, which moduli stabilization might pull you away from that anyway, we don't know. So this is going to be our working definition in 4D, but you're right, there are a lot of uh, complications in the four-dimensional picture. OK, so the last thing I need to talk about as far as generic matter is concerned is how it plays with discrete quotients, because uh, course, in this talk, I'm going to be tuning SU3 times SU2 times U1 with a Z6 discrete quotient. 
So it turns out that the global structure of the gauge group does affect what generic, what matter representations are generic. So here I've written down uh, a list of the 10 generic matter representations for SU3 times SU2 times U1 with no quotient on the left, which I'm calling G standard model. And then on the right, the generic matter representations for this gauge group with the Z6 quotient. And you'll notice right off that they're different. The uh, non-abelian structures are the same, but the hypercharges are different. And uh, if you're familiar with the, the standard model, you'll note that the standard model matter is not present in the left column, but it is in the right column. So for example, we don't have the proper hypercharge on the uh, left-handed quark doublet representation at the bottom here, and the hypercharges on all of the standard model representations are wrong in the left column. And so this is going to be the main motivation for why I'm focusing on the standard model with the Z6 quotient. Because if it were actually the case that the standard model were realized without the quotient, then it would seem that we'd have to do a very non-generic tuning. We'd have to tune a lot of extra degrees of freedom to actually find the matter representations that we observe in nature. So it seems much more generic that we would actually have this Z6 quotient present. Now you might also ask the question, um, in the argument I just gave, I took as a prior the matter representations that we observe. What if I don't take that as a prior? What if I just ask the anthropic question, uh, which of these gauge group structures is actually preferred? And it turns out that they're roughly equal. So for example, in six dimensions of t equals zero, you can just explicitly count the number of models here. And the number of generic matter models without the quotient is on the same order as the number of generic matter models with the quotient. So if you don't prior on the charges that we actually see in nature, then there's no reason to favor one or, or over the other, necessarily. And this, this uh, feature holds more generally. The so when you say generic, you mean having this as group, not the only group? Uh, as not the only group? Sorry. Sorry, when you say you look at the matter structure having 66, do you mean 66 of them have this as part of the gauge group or the full gauge group? What I mean is that the, so here uh, we're looking at, this would be F theory on P2, but this is just explicitly solving the uh, anomaly cancellation conditions for this as the entire gauge group. So, if you have a decoupled gauge vector, you multiply this number by something, which is the number of solutions in that gauge vector. But so, so the generic is not. So when you say these, these are your somewhat generic, it's for generic mark like or for the P two without the function does not have this case symmetry. So you're only assuming that you're looking for them. Right. So th this is again fixing the gauge group at that time. So assume that we have tuned. So so let's so restrict fine, ourselves to the so fine space that's where we have uh, tuned either this gauge group or this gauge group. So the now, word generic is it's funny here. It's, it's generic, generic matter, not generic gauge group. Oh, That's the no, distinction okay. that I want to make. Yeah, so, Got it. Okay. so there's a separate question of what gauge groups are generic and those are the non-gauge So you tune the gauge group on and see what is generic matter for that gauge group. Exactly. Okay. So within the branch of moduli space that has this tuned okay. gauge group, pick a random point, you're much more likely to find the standard model okay. matter here. But to get this gauge group is not generic anyhow. Right, you have to tune. You have to tune something at this gauge. There's, I mean, there's no, there's no theory of whatever model which says this is a generic gauge group in that class. Right. I mean, so you can separately play the game of trying to find SU three times SU two as a non hexable cluster, and that's not what we're doing here. And well, um, is there an example where the generic gauge group is exactly SU three plus SU two plus U one plus Z six? So the U one is a little bit <coughs> tricky, and the Z six is even trickier. But there are there are definitely examples of SU three times SU two non hexable clusters, and you can't have non hexable U ones. I don't know off the top of my head if there are cases where they're all present at the same time, especially with the Z six quotient. I don't think anyone has done that analysis. No idea has done that analysis because it's hard. It, yeah, exactly. Okay. So now, uh, equipped with this generic matter classification, I'm going to talk about F3 tunings of this, this gauge group with generic matter. So again, I'm going to start uh, just from 60 supergravity to get a sense of what kinds of models we're going to see. So I'm going to fix uh, a choice of anomaly coefficients. Uh, this A is the gravitational anomaly coefficient, and we're going to have B3, B2, and B twiddle, respectively corresponding to B3, 2, and 1 gauge factors. And then for convenience, I'm going to define some new uh, variables in terms of these variables that will make the multiplicities nice to write down. And then, as I said, the number of generic matter representations 
exactly matches the number of non-trivial anomaly uh, cancellation conditions. So I can just exactly solve the 60 anomaly equations for the multiplicities of generic matter. And this is what I find. OK, so now I want to try to get a handle on what types of models show up here. And so I'm now going to specialize to the case where we have no tensor multiplets and use this sort of as inspiration for the more general case. Again, we're just working in 60 supergravity here, but this corresponds to F theory on CP2 as base. So in general, these A's and B's are vectors in an SO1 comma T lattice. But in this case, with T equals 0, they're just numbers, which is why this is a particularly simple case. A in particular is minus 3. And I know that in order to have the proper signs on my gauge kinetic terms in the Lagrangian, B3 and B2 have to be positive. So now I can look over at this table of uh, multiplicities and see, for example, uh, here, I know B3 must be positive, and I certainly know that I need a non-negative number of hypermultiplets charged under a given representation. So this leads me to the conclusion that X must also be non-negative. Similarly, from this row, we can read off that Y must be non-negative. Now using this, we can go down to look at this row of the table. And I see that there are sort of two cases where this can be a non-negative multiplicity. And I'm going to split my solutions into these two different classes. The first is the case that beta itself is non-negative, because I know that y is non-negative. And the second is the case where y itself is equal to 0. Now, there is overlap between these two classes, so there will be solutions that are actually in both classes. But it's a useful, we'll see shortly that this is actually a useful split um, when we try to construct these analogies. Another thing to note in particular is that if we take the class y equals 0, it sets these rows uh, to 0, so there's no multiplicities for these representations, zero multiplicity. And these three representations are not, stand, uh, not present in the standard model. So this class in particular has fewer opportunities for non-standard model matter among our uh, matters. Okay. So now I'm going to consider these two classes of 60 models and see if I can construct them in F3. So at t equals 0, all 98 of these 60 t equals 0 models fall into one or both of the classes, and it turns out that we can construct them all in F3, so there is no swap left. The first class, which have beta greater than or equal to 0, I'm going to call SU4 times SU3 times SU2 type, because uh, just from looking at the anomaly cancellation conditions and the matter spectrum, you can see that these are all unhazable to a 432 gauge group. So there are 71 models that fall into this class, at t equals 0. And are, it's a three parameter family of solutions. And so, as I said, these are all unhazable to SU4 times SU3 times SU2. And you can make this identification of the anomaly coefficients of the 4, 3, and two gauge factors in terms of the anomaly coefficients for the 3, 2, 1 model that we started with. And this is exactly what allows us to construct these in F-theory, because we know how to tune SUNs in F-theory. So we start with the Tate construction of SU4 times SU3 times SU2, and then Higgs it on, a, on two pairs of five fundamental fields. And we can, uh, we can do this in F-theory, so we have captured all of the, uh, all of the models in this class. The second class, the y equals 0 class, I'm going to call F11 type for a reason that uh, we'll see shortly. There are 30 models in this class at t equals 0. And so if you look at uh, 30 and 71 compared to this 98, you'll see that there are three models that are of both types. This is a two-parameter family. Um, to match onto the F11 literature, you can take your two parameters to be these capital S9 and S7 defined here in terms of the uh, anomaly coefficients of the 3, 2, 1 model. <coughs> and all models in this class are realized in F-theory using what is known as the F11 toric fiber, which is why I'm calling these F11 type models. So this is a construction that allows you to realize the, uh, the elliptic fiber <coughs> as a hypersurface inside of a two-dimensional toric variety. And this is a very nice construction because it's toric. It gives us a lot of combinatorial tools to work with when describing these, these models. It also turns out that all but three of the models in this class can be unhigged to a petit salon type model. Unfortunately, the three models that cannot are not the same three models that also appear in, in class A. 
Um, so this gives us a second way to construct uh, all of these models by doing a take tuning of SU4 times SU2 times SU2 with these anomaly coefficients. Of particular interest is uh, one model in this class, which is simultaneously of F11 type, as all of the models are here, AT Salon type, and also on Higgs equal to SU5. And uh, this will come up again later. This has been discussed uh, at length in a recent paper by uh, Miriam Kudaj and others. Okay, so now we've seen that for 60t equals zero, we can capture all of the models in F theory. And we're going to use these two classes as inspiration moving forward uh, for general 60 and then 40. And so now I'm going to specifically talk about 40. To generalize these two classes to 40, I'm just going to use the exact same constructions that I used in six dimensions in F30. So for class A, I'm going to construct these as SU4 times SU3 times SU2 take tunings and then deform them to reach uh, 3, 2, 1 mod Z6. And we can, uh, over a given choice of base, we can just enumerate all of the possible uh, solutions of this type from these Tate and Kodaira bounds that come from that theory. In four dimensions, the uh, multiplicities that we saw on the slide in 60 uh, don't give us the multiplicities in four dimensions, but are rather promoted to matter curves that tell us the locus on which this matter is supported. So, for example, the six dimensional multiplicity we saw for the left handed cork doublet with B3 times B2, which tells us that in four dimensions this matter is supported along the intersection of the divisors B3 and B2. And an important thing to note is although there are uh, non standard model uh, representations within the generic matter classification in this case, it's not necessarily the case that any of those non MSSM generic matter representations are chiral. That data is uh, determined by the addition of fluxes, which is extra data on top of the geometric information that we specify here. For class B, we can construct them again either using the F11 fiber or in most cases as a deformed Petit Salam model. This F11 fiber has been used to construct three generation models for this to try to match with the standard model. And the special SU5 case that I uh, singled out earlier has been studied, as I said, at length in this recent paper called the Quadrillion Standard Models from F theory, where they looked at this particular choice of uh, B3 and B2 anomaly coefficients and tuned three generations, and then they got the Quadrillion Standard Models just by considering this Weierstrass model over all weak family bases. Actually, it's just one question. Yeah. The chiral gauge series plays a role in your setup, like the chiral gauge theory. Yes. Well, so in four dimensions, we, we go beyond the story that I'm talking about here and have to add fluxes to the game, and that's what determines the chiral index for any given representation. Yeah, so the matter multiplicities that you determine pre the introduction of fluxes are telling you non chiral information. But it's the previous model you have, like 80 something number of models, all are chiral gauge theory or is it not? Yeah, so here oh, 90, we, sorry, uh, Yeah, so in 60, uh, this is non-chiral in the sense that every representation here is actually quaternionic. So anytime I write a representation down, I'm actually talking about this representation plus its conjugate. Um, the anomaly is, of course, contributed to by chiral uh, fields, which gives rise to the anomaly. But yeah, so here we're not concerned with chirality because these are all quaternionic representations. But in four dimensions, the information about the chiral index is contained in these flexes. But do you have a natural way to get rid of this conjugate chiral matter? Uh, in four dimensions? Yes. Uh, well, yeah, again, it all depends on the flexes. So this is, a, this is another analysis that we're actually doing currently uh, with Patrick Jefferson and Wadi Taylor. We're looking at putting in fluxes to this general class of models to see what kind of chiral matter we can get. Okay. Um, and then you can play the game of trying to match this exactly to the chiral matter content of the standard model. And uh, in, this, in this paper, uh, put it in standard models of F, uh, from F theory, where they're looking at this specific special case, they, they do go through that and they also check a bunch of other consistency conditions. And that's sort of the next step that you can try to play with this much more general class of models to see how closely you can match the observed standard model. Chiral matter. So, so what's the rough idea that, uh, sorry, I'm an outsider. So what's the rough idea you get rid of a chiral conjugate matter? 
what's the idea of all the flux flux here? I don't understand. Yeah, yeah. So so you're introducing G four flux uh, from the M theory picture that wraps certain cycles, and you can look at there is a set of consistency conditions about what kinds of flux you can turn on. So a priori of just inter integrally quantized flux, but many of the choices that you might naively choose uh, cause problems in your theory, like they'll break all of the supersymmetry or they'll uh, uh, cause other inconsistencies. And so you have to do a careful analysis to try to determine which fluxes you can turn on. And then once you have a given choice of flux, you can write down the chiral index uh, in terms of intersections of that flux uh, in, in, with various curves in the manifold that support these matter representations. So very simple version of it that uh, you, you must have seen in condensed matter is like if you have a sphere with a B field, mm -hmm. you choose one chirality of fermion mm -hmm. as a zero. Mm -hmm. so, so this is very much like this. You have Riemann surfaces and you have B fields through it, roughly speaking. Mm -hmm. And you just have to know how many you get from each one. Which you pick, pick one versus the other depending on what flux you have through. Yeah. But, but uh, the zero mode here, is there some kind of a conjugate two type of zero modes and you get rid of a part of the sector of a zero mode? Yeah, if you have no B field, you get both zero modes. If you have a, if you have B field, you pick one hand, one spin, not the other. Yeah, which, the one which is aligned with respect to B field, correct? Mm -hmm. So that you break chiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Create. So, so what you're measuring by this, the chiral index, is specifically the difference in the number of hypermultiples charged under a representation and the number charged under its conjugate. That's exactly the chiral index that you're measuring. Uh, yeah. Condensed matter. That is idea. I read paper that uh, try to get rid of uh, this uh, conjugate chiral matter by non perturbed interactions, and those interactions usually cannot be analyzed. Oh, no, no, sorry, this is different. This is, he's going from six dimension to four dimension. Right. So six dimension, it's not, there's no chirality. Four, when you put it on yeah. a sphere or something, you get yeah. extra stuff. Every representation that I'm writing in four dimensions should Just actually be interpreted as this. So it always there has cannot be any, any chirality in six dimensions. But how about when you go down to four D? You yeah, when, when, you go, when you go down to 4D, there is, there is chirality. But yeah. you still want to get rid of those. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least, well, at least at all, no energy, you don't want to see those chiral matter. That's, you want to see chiral matter. I want to see exactly the chiral matter that's in the standard model. I want to find three generations. Oh, there's the conjugate chiral matter. There's no conjugate chiral matter? No. Just like oh, zero modes, you see, like, so if you, if you go, suppose your space is R4 times 2 sphere. Right. In 60, you don't have a chirality. You generate chirality by putting a B field through S2, and zero modes of the drag operator gives you chiral matter. Okay. But can I view those uh, chiral matters in some higher energy? Okay, that's good. Good. Okay. Thanks. Good. Cool. Okay. Um, so now I'm interested in trying to find a Weierstrass model that describes all of the models that we talked about in a more vague sense in the last section. And again, the reason I'm interested in this is this gives me a very concrete mathematical description where I can start answering concrete questions about these models. So our goal is to identify an explicit generic virus Ross model for this gauge group, analogous to the Tate model for SUN or the Morrison Park model for U1 that we saw earlier. And what do I mean by a generic virus Ross model? I, I want this to satisfy two constraints. First, it should give exactly the generic matter representations for this gauge group. And second, it should be the most general such model that, that uh, gives this generic matter in the sense that it should capture all of the moduli. And uh, this can be confirmed explicitly in 60, where we have this anomaly cancellation condition that's explicitly counting the number of moduli for us. Now, in order to do this, we have to be able to count the number of moduli of the bias ross model. And this is not too hard to do for SUN factors. You can explicitly count uh, the moduli in Tate form and confirm that Tate form itself is generic. But it's more difficult with the introduction of U1 factors. So for example, the Morrison Park model is a redundant parameterization, so the naive counting uh, overcounts the number of moduli that you have. But you can count it using a Jacobian argument that I'll come back to when we count the moduli for our virus stress model. OK. So how are we going to go about constructing this uh, generic virus Ross model? Uh, the naive thing to do would be just to brute force it and try to simultaneously do a Morrison Park tuning of the U1 and a Tate tuning of the SU3 times SU2 and combine these in such a way that the Z6 quotient is in force, uh, either through Mordell Bay torsion or using the fractional part of the Shioda map that appears when describing these U1s. But this is pretty hard. Um, we tried to do this for a while and didn't make much headway. But uh, 
a lucky miracle occurred, and we noticed that actually an existing Firestrass model, specifically Nikhil Radaram's uh, U1 model that has up to charge four matter, so this is a non-generic U1 uh, model, can be allocated directly to SU3 times SU2 times U1 mod Z6. And so that model has some very large F and G in the Weierstrass model that are, that are too big to put on the slide. But if you take two parameters of that model and tune them to uh, vanish identically, then you find this F and G, um, which are going to be the F and G defining our Weierstrass model. So these have some parameters BI and DI and SI uh, that appear uh, in these F and G. Okay, so let's uh, investigate the properties of this Weierstrass model and see if it is the Weierstrass model that we actually want. So first off, uh, you can verify that it does have the proper gauge group. So in order to see uh, where you have singularities in the Weierstrass model, you just look at the zeros of this particular combination of F and G, which is called the discriminant. And we find that the discriminant is proportional to D1 cubed and D0 squared, which tells us after checking a split condition for the, the SU3, that this is actually an SU3 times SU2 gauge factor. You have the SU3 supported on the locus B1 equals zero, and the SU2 supported on the locus D0 equals zero. You can also identify an additional section beyond the required zero section that is non-torsional, and this is what gives rise to E1 gauge groups in F theory. Um, the quotient, again, is subtle. It's a priori unclear whether it should come from Mordell Bay torsion, which would involve an additional section that is torsional of order six, or whether it comes from a fractional component that appears in the Shioda map uh, when you have U1 uh, gauge factors present. Uh, we believe now that it actually should be the latter due to a recent argument that uh, Wadi talked about actually at this Amherst uh, meeting recently. So we're still nailing down the story here, but we can tell from the matter spectrum that we find, and specifically the hypercharges on that matter, that this quotient does actually have to be there. Okay, so this is good. It gives us exactly the gauge group that we wanted. We can also count the moduli that are present here, and so this is that Jacobian argument I was talking about. So because we're worried about redundant parameterization, what we're going to do is this. So first, fix a random choice of all of the parameters B, I, D, I, and S, I that appeared in the F and G on the previous page. So this is just picking a, a random particular model out from this, this uh, Weierstrass model. And now I'm essentially going to probe the dimension of the, the tangent space uh, around that random model. So I'm going to parameterize F and G in terms of some variables, and separately parameterize uh, B and D and S in terms of some variables and then just compute the rank of the Jacobian matrix. And this will tell me the dimension of the tangent space there. And that will give the dimension of the moduli space around this random choice of model. Now, I could get unlucky and pick a random model that actually has a lower dimensional tangent space. So what we've actually done is uh, checked for thousands of different random choices that cover all, uh, sort of broadly cover the choice of, uh, the space of choices you can make for this. And in every single case, we've compared them to the number of moduli we expect from 60 anomaly cancellation and find an exact match. So we're confident that this does actually capture all of the moduli. And so this is, in fact, the generic Weierstrass model that we're looking for. OK, um, we can go and check that it actually does give us all of the models that we talked about in the last section, which we hope it does. And it turns out that it does. So with this. Um, rather unfortunate identification of parameters. We can take the B1, which supports the SU3, the D0 that supports the SU2, and this S1 term and match them onto the anomaly coefficients B3, B2, and beta that we saw when we were talking about 6D supergravity earlier. And very excitingly for us, this case actually, or uh, this Weierstrass model explicitly exhibits the SU5 on Higgsing. Uh, for that special case that looked from the supergravity point of view that it should admit this on Higgsing. Um, this is important because it, it shows that this actually does exhibit a chance for gauge unification. Is it generic that you said? It wasn't, you started with the SU3 cross S2 cross U1, you're looking for conditions, why it starts to realize it's generic, right? Yes. But is this on Higgsing to SU5 generic? Or? Well, this is a particular model in that large class of models. Okay. So this is picking out a particular model of this and then showing that there is a deformation that actually lets us enter the test. So you don't think this is generic? No, in fact, this is, uh, I mean, 
You could imagine a situation maybe where the 432 on Higgs could fit into an even larger gauge group, but you'd have to, of course, tune the SU4 and SU3 and SU2 all on the same divisor. The reason that this is unfixable to a single gauge factor is because B3 and B2 in this case were set both to be the anti canonical divisor. And so that even allows for the possibility of this anti And uh, again, this is the case that was talked about in the uh, quadrillion standard models from F theory. And it turns out that this uh, unhixing is rather subtle. So the naive thing that you would do would be you, you want to have uh, the SU3 and the SU2 and the U1 all coalesce into a single locus that supports an SU5. And uh, that would correspond to have some, having some curve where you have uh, order of vanishing 5 up here. So the naive thing is just to set B1 equals to Z0. And then you get uh, a discriminant proportional to B1 to the fifth, and you have an SU5. But if you actually do that, you end up getting an extra U1 gauge factor. So you end up with SU5 times U1, which is not what we want for gauge unification. It turns out the proper way to do this is to set D1 to be D1, or sorry, D0 equal to B1 shifted uh, by some amount that's proportional to this scalar. So because this is a scalar, uh, it is allowed to appear uh, in the denominator of our, all of our field redefinitions. So the full set of field redefinitions that you do here are, are parameter redefinitions involves inverse powers of epsilon, which naively makes it seem like you could not take the limit epsilon goes to zero. But sort of miraculously, all of the inverse powers of epsilon cancel in F and G. And so you can actually uh, take the limit epsilon goes to zero, and in that limit, you recover exactly the NC5. Which, uh, that made us very happy. Okay, so we now believe that we have uh, the generic Weierstrass model for this gauge group. So this should give a general construction of possibly all tuned SU3 times SU2 times U1 mod Z6 for the F theory models over a given base. Uh, so for example, you could choose the simplest case, take your base to be CP3, and again, you can run over the, uh, the Tate bound of all possible values of the VI and find that there are 181 models of class A and 54 models of class B with six in the overlap. And you could, you could play this exact same game over any other base of your choosing. Uh, this class of Weierstrass models generalizes the uh, SU5 construction that appeared in this quadrillion standard models from F3. Uh, paper, and that, that was again a toric construction because it was of this F11 type. So, in all of these, yeah. so, so as far as I understand from your models, these generic constructions do not require the couplings to be near each other at all. Correct. Yeah. So, this is basically unexplained from your perspective, from this perspective. The fact that the couplings might unify in a specific <laughs> SU5 case? Or even come close because there's no relation between the modules. Right, exactly. So, so all we're showing is that this, this particular model that they talked about exhibits the possibility of SU5 gauge unification. The reason it's even possible from this point of view is, again, because the, the 3 and 2 factors are tuned on the same divisor, um, or divisor, divisors in the same class. And yeah, again, you'd have, to, you'd have to do a more careful analysis to actually show the gauge unification occurs. Yeah. Um, but for a... For a uh, general random choice in this class, you wouldn't even have the possibility of gauge unification. Now, uh, as in the case of this SU5 special case model, all of these models work over all weak FANO bases. So you can uh, put these on the same roughly quadrillion bases that they were talking about in this paper. But additionally, for the class A models, uh, which don't have y equals to zero, or, or rather have uh, beta greater than or equal to zero, uh, many of these will work on uh, bases that have non hexable gauge groups, which again give us candidates for dark matter sectors. So this actually opens up to a, a, us up to a much broader class of bases, which is very, very large. And the final step, or the next step in this analysis, would be to go through and do the same sort of careful analysis that they carried out here, try to put chiral matter in and try to match exactly the three generations that we see in the standard model. And that's what we're doing in ongoing work with uh, Wadi Taylor and Patrick Jefferson. OK, so uh, to summarize, uh, I defined this generic matter classification, which was particularly useful to us here but is more broadly useful as an organizational principle for answering questions about the swampland or making anthropic arguments about what kinds of uh, matter you expect to see for given choices of gauge group. 
It's defined uh, most concretely in six dimensions in terms of uh, the moduli space and supergravity, but then we generalize to four dimensions using F theory. We use this classification to identify supergravity and F theory models with this particular gauge group and the generic matter associated with that gauge group. And we found two classes. The first class, we construct an F theory as deformed 4, 3, 2 models. And this is the larger of the two sets, as it is a three parameter uh, set of models. And because it can go on this more general class of bases, in many cases, it is compatible with non fixable dark matter. The second class of models was this F11, or in most cases, Petit Salam uh, class of models. It was only a two parameter set. It's nice because it has this very explicit torque construction through the F11 fiber, which again gives us a lot of combinatorial tools to do careful analysis of these models. And it also conveniently has fewer non MSSM matter representations within this whole class of models. We then identified a generic Weierstrass model that unifies both of these classes of models and captures all of the moduli. And so we expect that if the standard model is actually tuned as opposed to being uh, non hixable or coming from flux breaking of some gut, then this is exactly how it should look in F3. So, thank you. Any questions? Carol? So, for the non, for the non tuned versions, uh, mm -hmm. which you weren't describing too much in this talk, but is it? Known which ones, how many are them which gives you some model gauge group and matter? And matter, I don't believe so. There's, so there's a paper by um, Grassy, Halverson, Shainson, and Taylor that sort of is the the only careful analysis of SU3 times SU2 non feasible cluster that I'm aware of that you can dig through. But um, Did they get the SU3 cross SU2 cross U1? Not the cross U1, you're just looking at the three, three times two. Yeah. So do you find uh, any new matters or new extent options based on other big Extended objects. Um, well, so in terms of new matter, uh, within this class of, of models, we do have the um, these extra matter representations that are possibly appearing, like a uh, minus four thirds hypercharge SU3 and so on, SU3 fundamental. Um, so within this this broad class, we do get non M non MSSM looking things, but uh, it's not, it's not zero right, right. We're we're, we're not predicting the existence of new structures here. I mean, this is this is a fairly typical sort of F theory construction. The issue is just finding it. Yeah. Okay. Do you find anything like representational operators, like surfaces? Um, from from this analysis, no. There's nothing nothing new there really. Yeah, again, this, this fits into sort of the standard of the picture. Yeah. Well, I think a simple answer to that question would be if you take E3 brains and if they wrap down any two cycles, yeah. you get the word G3. Yeah, there so always these strings thing. everything here I've been talking about is the seven brain sector. Okay. So this is another thing that they, um, in the quadrillion standard models from F3 paper, they went through a careful analysis of the G3 sector as well, which had a bunch of consistency conditions that it. If you're being careful, you have to go through that as well. Well, you're, I'm, I'm not, no, I think we're talking about two different things. One is you clean the three brain wrapped around four cycles. Right. I was just talking about the three brain wrapped around two cycles. Mm, yeah, and, yeah. And giving us strings in the four dimensional space. Right. So, which is, yeah. we, we're not interested so much in standard model questions, but yeah. there are these objects. Yeah. So, so, in order to specify what's the low energy theory, do you also need to also provide those data? Other than Not necessarily theory. because their tension, their mass is related to the size of these cycles, and they could be near God's scale mass, so you don't have to talk about it. Can, can you tell from the, this F theory construction? Can you tell the energy scale? For yeah, this? yeah. If it's supersymmetric, the 1 over G squared, the coupling constant is their tension uh, in, 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 in the same sense, because they're the same volume of the same object. Any more questions? No, they're saying intro again. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>